Hello class, today we'll be looking at Chapter 7, The Transport Layer. We'll, after this lecture, be able to describe the purpose of the transport layer and managing data's end-to-end -end communication. We'll be able to describe the characteristics of two protocols, TCP and UDP, including what port numbers are and their uses, explaining how TCP session establishment termination processes facilitate reliable communication. We'll be able to explain how TCP protocol data units are transmitted and acknowledged to guarantee delivery end-to-end, -end, and explain the UDP client process to establish communication with the server. You'll be able to determine whether high reliability TCP transmissions or non-guaranteed UDP transmissions are the best choice for common applications. Let's take a look at the role of the transport layer. If you caught uh, the lecture on our last chapter, the network layer, we learned about the IP protocol and how it was unreliable. And I had mentioned during that lecture that there was another layer, the transport layer, that could provide this reliability end to end. And now we get to talk about it. So the role of the transport layer is pretty important. It's the first layer that actually tears data apart. So data comes down from layer seven to six to five, and it's a stream of data intact, uh, maybe an email, a web page, a file transfer, and then it's at layer four, the transport layer, where it is segmented into shippable pieces. Each piece is labeled with a source port and a destination port. We'll cover what those ports mean. They essentially identify what application it's coming from and what application it's going to. If you're using TCP, um, it would also provide sequence numbers so that the pieces or segments of the communication could be reassembled in the correct order and could be reset if missing pieces were discovered. So the transport layer is responsible for establishing a temporary communication session between two applications. So remember layer three, the network layer connects two devices computer to computer. Layer four is connecting applications on those devices. So your web browser to the web server. So layer four is dealing application to application. And you have a choice. Layer four can use one of two common protocols, either TCP or UDP. And we'll be looking at both in great detail. In general, the transport layer provides tracking of the communication between those applications. It segments data for manageability so that they can be sent in small chunks out on the network and then reassembled. And it identifies the proper application for each arriving segment. So when we segment the data, the benefit of segmentation showed here in this illustration, if you look at the colored squares, it's to represent each color is a different conversation, all being put on the same link. This allows us to better share a, a pathway, a roadway, the media. The media is our copper wires, our fiber optic, our wireless. Uh, if we allowed one device to send one super large, long um, transmission, it would hog that resource for too long a time. Again, I'll use an analogy, our road system. We have defined maximum length or size for vehicles. For instance, in some states, you can't have a triple trailer semi truck, only the double trailers. And by indicating what the maximum size is for any one vehicle, if you were wanting to send something really large, you have to disassemble it into pieces and ship it and then reassemble it. And they do that with large earth moving equipment, even houses. They like uh, some of these mobile homes that will cut them up and then ship them on trucks and then reassemble them at the assembly site. What we're doing is no different than that. We're setting uh, maximums and our maximum we learned a couple lectures ago when we were looking at the frame is a frame cannot be larger than 1,522 bytes. And really the data can't be much larger than around 1,500 bytes. And so we have to have a segmentation process that can cut a really large, sometimes like this video, this stream of my voice and this video content would go on and on and on and hog up all the bandwidth so it is cut up into small pieces or chunks and then assembled at the receiving end. 
So we have to add a header to each of our segments to identify who sent it, who it's destined to, and some reassembly instructions. So let's look at adding reliability. There's one protocol that does that, and that's TCP. So TCP is the reliability protocol. What TCP will do if you choose it, if your application chooses TCP, it's really up to the application and whoever programmed or wrote that application to choose which protocol they're going to use. TCP ensures reliable delivery. So if something doesn't arrive, it is resent. It does this through an acknowledgement. Specifically, we call it a positive acknowledgement. What that means is if you're the receiver of data and something's missing, you don't have to do anything. You don't acknowledge things you don't get. You do a positive acknowledgement. Every piece of data you do receive, you have to send an acknowledgement back to the sender that says, thank you, I received that. Thank you, I received that. If the sender does not receive back a positive acknowledgement for a chunk of data, it knows that you did not receive it because you did not not acknowledge it. It would then resend that data. So TCP requires that a copy of all the data be kept on the sending side until it is acknowledged. So it requires more RAM and more bandwidth and more administrative or management overhead to do that reliability piece. It also has uh, synchronization, timing, so everything is time stamped and labeled uh, with a sequence number so that if the data arrives out of order, it can be resequenced and put back into the correct order. Let's look at UDP. UDP is the unreliable version of TCP. UDP doesn't acknowledge anything. There's no acknowledgement function. It doesn't keep a copy of anything in RAM. It has no ability to resend. It just sends it and forgets it. Zero reliability. Essentially, it's the same as what we have at layer three with the IP packet. And so UDP might on the surface appear like a protocol you would not want to use because of the lack of reliability. Let's imagine a couple use scenarios. If, for instance, you're having a live video conference with someone and you're talking back and forth, there's really no value to resending lost information. It's happening live. You can't fit it in later because the next slide and the next piece of voice is already playing. There's no advantage to play it out of order. It's being played as it arrives. So UDP would be a better choice because you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the reliability mechanism of TCP. Also, UDP has less overhead, means it uses less bandwidth, therefore things move faster. So with voice and video that typically like a fast connection, UDP is often preferred. So we find UDP in a lot of real-time things. Uh, video games uh, prefer UDP, video conferences, uh, voice over IP phone calls, anything that has a real-time nature to it. UDP is also chosen by some unlikely protocols, DNS for one, when you type in a URL like yahoo.com into your web browser, before it can go to Yahoo, it has to find the IP address for that URL. It uses a DNS server, and DNS typically chooses UDP as a faster protocol because you're sending a small chunk of information, the URL. It fits in a single packet, so we don't have to worry about sequencing. And generally, your DNS server is at your place of business or at your ISP, so it doesn't have to travel far across the internet. So we don't really have to worry too much about the reliability, so UDP is chosen there as well. Microsoft uses UDP extensively with the Windows operating system for client server operations. And that is typically because the client and the server are going to be on the same network, usually the same LAN and LANs have very high reliability at the physical layer, so there's no need to really have extra reliability at layer four. So there are appropriate uses where UDP is employed. Of course, we have a trade-off, and you have to really think about that trade-off when deciding which protocol would be the best fit for a particular application. TCP, we already kind of covered this, it's got uh, flow control, which is the time stamping to uh, regulate the amount of data transmitted. So we call this windowing. We can control how much data is sent and slow that down or speed that up. This is useful if, for instance, you were saying sending a big file download in the receiver 
had the CPU maxed out doing some other jobs and really couldn't deal with so much information coming in so fast, they could send a TCP message back to the sender saying, slow it down, I can't handle all this information as quick as you're sending it. So flow control is an important mechanism that helps us not have to resend things or have things uh, lost because one end um, could not move as fast as the other. So there are several advantages to TCP. UDP, of course, its advantage is really speed and low overhead. I mentioned where it might be used. You see it listed there. Port numbers. So how do we know what application is what? We say we identify the source application and the destination application. Well, we do that through a port number. And so we put a source and a destination port number. Typically, the source port number is a made-up number that identifies the window or process on your computer. For instance, in a web browser, you may have several tabs or windows open, and we have assigned a port number to each of those within the computer. The computer just does this automatically and makes up those numbers. And so that's um, what we would call an unregistered number. It's just a made-up number the computer assigns to every window, and that would be put in the source port field so that when the request came back, it knew which window to display the results in. Now, the destination port number is usually what we call a well-known port number, and a well-known or public port is one that is registered with IANA to a particular application, like a web server is port 80. Internet chat is port 531. Get the idea. So here's an example here. In the orange box, you can see the source port is a made-up number, 1305, and it's going to a well-known destination 21, which is FTP. So it's coming from an FTP client, probably your web browser window, and it's going to an FTP server is how you would read that. And in the bottom example, you can see the same thing. Uh, source port is a made-up number. No, it's a different made-up number than above. Same computer, but makes up two different numbers for two different windows or processes and they're going to two different well-known ports. Well-known ports are typically port numbers um, under 1,024. So port numbers higher than 1,024 are called unregistered ports, and that's how I'm able to identify them here is the source port numbers are 1,024 or higher. Also, well-known ports, you uh, start memorizing them over time because they are well-known. That's why they're called that. Here's a look at how that works. And uh, so our well-known ports are 0 through 123. You can see some of the uh, port numbers listed here. Here is a look at port numbers. You can type the netstat command, and you can see the port numbers here. You can see the local port uh, numbers 3126, 3158, 3159, 3160, just made up numbers. Uh, they can be in sequence. They don't have to be. Usually computers uh, just do things in sequence. And that first part of it before the colon is the IP address, uh, Ken PC. But in this case, it's the URL, right? So it's the PC name, KinPC. You can actually modify the netstat command with, I think it's dash n, and it will, um, it will actually give you the IP address instead of the name. Then you have a lab where you get to use the netstat command. You get to look at the port numbers operating on your computer. Here's an example again of source ports connecting to destination ports and notice the source ports are always unregistered ports connecting to a well-known destination. Okay, let's talk about TCP's three-way handshake. One thing TCP does that UDP doesn't do is because TCP is connection oriented, it has a three-way handshake which is establishment of the session. It sends a packet 
a segment that um, shares the starting number for the sequence number that it would like to start sequencing the segments that it sends. And this allows the receiver to know what the first segment will be numbered and, and it can then keep track of the segments it receives. You can see this three-way handshake take place uh, through using the Wireshark program. An ACK is an acknowledgement, and so if there's an ACK, here we have acknowledgement number one, so that is acknowledging previously received segments. This is what the three-way handshake um, looks like in terms of uh, finishing the session. So this is the three-way handshake is used to establish and to terminate the session. So when we're done sending, let's say PCA is done sending, they send a fin, they just turn on the fin flag, which change it from a zero to a one, and it says I'm finished. So PCB would receive that and it would send an acknowledgement back saying, I, have, I acknowledge that you are done sending. And then in this case, PCB is also done because we're not actually terminating our session until the other side says goodbye as well. Again, think of a human conversation. If on the phone I say goodbye, I usually wait for the other person to say, all right, I'll see you, goodbye. So both sides need to say goodbye. So PCA is now waiting for PCB to also send the fin flag. So PCB marks the fin flag as I am also done and PCA acknowledges that. And at that point, they've both said finished and acknowledged the other one's finished. They hang up and that's the, uh, the three-way handshake. Oh, I should explain why it's a three-way. So look at two and three. See the bubbles that say two and three? Those come in the same segment. I can send an acknowledgement in the same segment that I set the, send, uh, the fin flag. So one is sent in its own segment, then two and three come back um, together in one segment, and then four is in its own segment. So there's an exchange of three segments. So that's why they call it the three-way handshake. Sequence numbers are used to reassemble the segments into their original order. One thing that happens when we have redundant paths to the same destination is that routers will choose a best path and that decision will change over time. So for load balancing and various things routers do, they, it tends to put your packets through a blender and they may arrive out of order. So packets that were sent earlier may arrive later than other packets. So on the receiving end, there's a need to resequence the segments into the correct order and you can see that is what's happening on the receiving side. It is those sequence numbers that allow that to happen. Now a word on window size and I mentioned this earlier. Window size is dynamic and can change during the conversation. It's not static. So we start with a window size initially of one and then that window size increases as the sender or receiver want to. Essentially, they say, okay, speed it up. You can talk faster. You don't have to talk so slow. So they do that by sending a larger window size. And we keep increasing the window size until the sender or receiver say, whoa, you're talking too fast now. Slow it down a little bit. And so it may increase and lower throughout the conversation. And that's to adjust to real conditions on the ground where the PCs or the network itself uh, may be changing in terms of their uh, ability to carry the data fast or process the data. So you send an acknowledgement for each window size. You don't actually acknowledge each segment. So it's more efficient to have larger window sizes because I can send a lot more data between them. So if my window size is 3,000, I can send 3,000 bytes of data before I get a single acknowledgement. And so that acknowledgement 3001 is acknowledging that all of the data was received. Now, here's the deal. Let's say you have that same window size of 3000. 
and some data gets lost. So notice now I'm sending an acknowledgement of 3001 because I'm unable to acknowledge the, uh, the data. I, it got lost, I never received it, and so I, I can't acknowledge that byte. So notice I'm not acknowledging the entire window. So the entire window will have to be resent. So that's the drawback of a large window, is you send a lot of data, and if you don't get an acknowledgement for it, you have to resend the whole window of data again. So what happens usually is the sender would shrink the window size if it's not getting acknowledgement. So it would send out it in smaller chunks and require a more frequent acknowledgement, which would adjust to um, loss on the network when data is not making it across. And then if, uh, if you're getting all the acknowledgements, the sender or the receiver might start increasing the window size and try to get more data through between acknowledgements. What this does is allow it to dynamically balance and find the happy medium between reliability and efficiency. So that's the purpose of the window size. So here's the segments coming and the acknowledgements coming back. Segments, acknowledgements, segments, acknowledgement. That's how it works. UDP, much easier to understand. No three-way handshakes, no session establishment. It has, uh, it's connectionless, so it doesn't need to talk to the other end. It just throws the segments out on the wire and uh, hopes they make it there. It has no way to know if they ever made it there because there's no acknowledgements and it has no mechanism for resending. So UDP is connectionless and unreliable. Also uh, has no way to resequence the data. So if uh, things arrive out of order as shown here, there's, uh, there's no method to put them back in the right order. UDP uses port numbers, registered port numbers. So there are registered port numbers for the applications that use UDP. Also, UDP uses unregistered port numbers, those randomly selected port numbers for the client. And you can see the same examples here. The client's going to choose a made-up port number and send it to a destination port. Here are some applications that choose TCP as their default. The web, file transfers, the ping protocol, SMTP, and the telnet protocol. Here are some that choose UDP. DCP, where you automatically get your IP settings across the network. DNS, where your URL is converted to an IP address. Simple network management protocol, which is used by Microsoft servers to manage clients. Trivial file transfer protocol, which is to move unimportant files across your network. Voice over IP, which is um, being able to make uh, phone calls over the internet. And IPTV, which is video conferencing. In summary, the role of the transport layer is to provide three main functions. Multiplexing, or sharing a single uh, shared line. So segmentation, which is uh, the second one there, and then reassembly and air checking. These functions are necessary in order to address issues in quality of service and security on networks. Knowing how TCP and UDP operate and which popular applications use each will help you with troubleshooting and building better networks. Ports provide a tunnel for data to get from the transport layer to the appropriate application. Thank you.